Alex, what is fluid overload and why is it a problem? In a nutshell, fluid overload is defined as a patient having a positive fluid balance. Fluid overload has been studied extensively in the adult and pediatric literature. We know that fluid overload is common, it affects surgical patients, and it is associated with adverse outcomes. In this study from Alberta, Canada, they reviewed over 1,000 PICU patients and found that fluid accumulation of greater than 10% was present in a third of their patients within the first few days of admission. As this table demonstrates, non-survivors had a significantly higher fluid overload percentage. Don't you think that we managed this well already? I believe that we as clinicians often underdiagnose fluid overload. In this study from Baylor, they found that greater than 90% of patients continue to receive more than maintenance fluids on ICU day three. More importantly, the majority of this extra fluid was potentially modifiable. In the same study, when they reviewed the medical records, they found that fluid overload was not treated or even documented in 30% of their patients. Therefore, recognition is the first step. We know from numerous studies that a fluid overload of greater than 15% is associated with increased rates of infection and delayed wound healing. It is also associated with worsening oxygenation and prolonged time on a ventilator. The first step for our patient is to recognize that fluid overload is present, calculate the degree of fluid overload, and then begin concentrating the intravenous fluids and remove any extraneous fluid. We would then also consider the use of diuretics at this time. Are there other patient populations that are particularly susceptible to fluid overload? The group in which the detrimental effects of fluid overload has been best studied is the postcardiotomy patient. In this systemic review, they found that fluid overload was an independent predictor of AKI development, longer ICU stay, and mortality. This dose response curve demonstrates an incremental increase in mortality for every percent increase in fluid overload. Fluid overload has also been looked at in patients with severe TBI. This population is at higher risk of fluid overload due to the early use of hypertonic fluids in their resuscitation. In this study, they looked at fluid overload at hospital day 10 and found that fluid overload was not associated with poor outcomes, but they did find that infants less than one year of age were at the highest risk of developing fluid overload. So before you mentioned acute kidney injury, is AKI considered to be independent of fluid overload? I think first it is important to define the degree of AKI. This can be done using Cadigo, P-Rifle, or Aiken guidelines. It is important to measure AKI on ICU day three because this actually reflects the degree of kidney injury. We know that AKI is common and with a 30% incidence in critically ill children. The causes can be multifactorial, but they can also be modifiable. AKI is associated with a longer ventilation time, hospital stay, and mortality. With our patient, AKI is a major concern given her elevated creatinine and oliguria, which has been associated with poor outcome. In this study from Atlanta, they found that having AKI or fluid overload was independently associated with poor outcomes. But when both were present simultaneously, they had a synergistic effect and the outcomes were much worse. So for our patient, should we consider something like CRT? Is she an appropriate candidate? And when would it be appropriate to start? Continuous renal replacement, or CRT, is a great adjunct when medical management of fluid overload has failed. It allows us to carefully titrate fluid and solute removal. Unfortunately, we know that children who require CRT have a higher mortality, and this is generally attributable to their underlying disease process. Studies have shown that for every percent increase in fluid overload at the time of CRT initiation, there is also an incremental increase in mortality. A few recent studies have looked at what factors are associated with mortality in patients who require CRT. Some factors that have been associated with worse outcomes are patients who require vasopressors, are on mechanical ventilation, or have an elevated BUN. Sepsis and neutropenia have been strongly associated with worse outcomes. This recent study from Australia found that the degree of fluid overload, the presence of a hemonc disease, or a higher pediatric index of mortality two score was strongly associated with increased mortality. The ideal time to initiate CRT is a much harder question to answer. In this same study, they found that survivors had CRT initiated earlier in their ICU course. So for our patient with fluid overload, I believe that we should consider our early CRT if she does not respond well to diuresis and fluid restriction. So Alex, what if our patient's clinical status continued to worsen and she needed ECMO support? How would you factor that into your decision about timing for CRRT? 
There have been a few recent studies that have looked at the effect of fluid overload and CRT on ECMO. In general, many children have fluid overload prior to initiating ECMO, and they are also at risk of developing fluid overload as part of the inflammatory response to being placed on ECMO. Studies have shown that the initial and peak fluid overload on ECMO is associated with a longer time on mechanical ventilation, longer ECMO runs, and increased mortality. It also appears that ECMO survivors tend to have CRRT initiated earlier in their run. Are there any other options for renal replacement therapy besides CRRT? I think the main options for renal replacement in our patient are peritoneal dialysis and CRRT. CRRT itself comes in many different flavors depending on the need for hemofiltration and or dialysis. There are many pros and cons to PD or CRT use. PD is great because it obviates the need for anticoagulation, avoids having to obtain vascular access, and is of lower cost. The downsides to PD include the lack of being able to accurately titrate fluid removal. It's a high risk of infectious complications, including peritonitis. It requires surgical placement with the need to allow sufficient time for wound healing. And catheter malfunctions occur commonly. CRRT is great because it is easily titratable and can be initiated at the bedside. The downsides include a high cost. It can be challenging to initiate and run in infants. It carries the risk of catheter-associated line infection and requires anticoagulation and exposure to blood products.